Awesome. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I know we're going to have some people hopping on uh, in the next couple, you know, minutes coming on, but welcome. I'm Sarah Perkins with Clear Title, and I'm excited. I'll definitely introduce you, Francisco, in a second. And, um, and of course, Ray, Ray's over. <laughs> help put everything together. Uh, we're just excited to be here. Francisco and I met pre-COVID. It's like the yeah. times are after. And BC. It was yeah, BC. BC. It yep. seems like a hundred years ago, but you know, a few years ago and just talking about what is, you know, useful and sharing good information, accurate, up-to-date information so people can make good choices. It's all about just what is going to serve you know, consumers today, homeowners today can, you know, the realtors and loan officers that are on this call looking at their own property and their own situation as well as their client situation. So one thing that I love about doing these things with Francisco is his focus so much is on education. My focus, you know, a clear title, our focus is on education. And so it has been very fun doing these events with you. And, you know, I, I get such awesome feedback and, you know, so we're just really excited to have that as our focus on, you know, just helping people make good choices and in the world we're in. Yeah. Lots of stuff is going on. It's really tough to figure out where do, you know, how do I guide people, especially when the conversations are changing, you know, minute to minute. And um, so I'm really excited with that. I want to, I want to, you know, absolutely introduce Ray and say, thank you, Ray. He works with Francisco and he's been so awesome in putting everything together and organizing and just making this happen. So thank you. And then of course, Francisco, thank you for, you know, being here. And you know what you just said a moment ago, of, hey, I don't have a slide deck because I just want to talk about what's happening right this second. And I love <laughs> that. That's beautiful. Well, Sarah, so, by the way, Sarah, shout out to you for your not only your enthusiasm, but your willingness to set these things up and get them in motion. And what a resource you are to your constituency. So kudos and thank you to Sarah Perkins. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And I, I will do one. I will put in the, the chat. I do have um, a Cromford market update coming up on October 12th. So I'll put the registration link in there if you want to hop on. Like I said, we're focused on education. And Francisco, I don't know if you've ever seen Tina Tambor present, but she knows everything about the market. It's incredible. I have. Yeah, impressive. Definitely. Yep. So I'll throw that in, but I also want to say, you know, hand it off to Francisco and just say thanks again, Francisco, for all that you do. And, um, you know, the floor is yours. Uh -huh. Thank you. So for those of you that haven't, uh, we haven't met before, uh, my name is Francisco Saran. I'm the founder of Keystone Law Firm in Chandler. And Sarah, truly thank you. Appreciate our friendship and our partnership um, for the time you give me to have a little bit of a stage here. This is this is, I, I, I love sharing. I was just doing a webinar last night for like intro to estate planning concepts. And I, I just in the middle of it, like I was just overcome with how grateful I was that people let me teach everything I can, but in a group setting, because it's like, we've all, you've all been doing your profession for so long. You're like, if I could just get all this into your head, you'd know all the stuff and be able to avoid all the problems too. And so anytime I can do it in a group setting, I love it. And um, this is what I do uh, for Keystone Law Firm as I try to get out and speak. And so today, uh, Sarah asked me to talk about a few key things related to real estate and uh, taxes and inflation. Um, way more than we can than we can cover in an hour. So I'm going to hit some high level concepts. I want to make sure that we start with some fundamentals that are still absolutely key for your success as an advisor to people who are buying or selling real estate. And um, it, it is absolutely key that all of us bring our best, absolute best game to our clients. I mean, these people rely on us 100% to tell them, go this way, go that way. Don't do this, do that. Oh, that's okay. It probably won't hurt if you do this. I mean, they rely on our experience to, to guide them through these things that are generally the biggest transactions of their life. Um, and so I, I appreciate you guys sticking in here with me. I'm going to do some whiteboarding. I hope that's okay. If I do, let's see if I can get it to work. Unable to load error code seven. 
probably i'll make you the co-host i think that that'll oh that. so let me my let me bad see. i could have warned you and if that doesn't work i can share my screen and, and pull up something to draw on my computer but i know zoom makes it run a little better if we use their whiteboard there it is do, 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 do. let's see here Um, I'm still getting a bizarre error, so that's okay. Um, what I will do is, all right, so you guys are going to get some real beautiful drawing. Actually, I know what I'll do. We'll make it even easier. So it is actually easy to look at. Um, the first thing that we really that I want to go over with you guys is something that um, affects every single real estate buyer or seller or owner, every single one. And unfortunately, when I teach this to attorneys, they it seems to be the first time a lot of attorneys have heard about this. Oh, look at you showing off your whiteboard. Sorry, I didn't think that that would do that. So I was That's trying totally to cool. I'll, I'll steal it from you. Don't worry. Um, if that's okay, that? I'm totally gonna steal it. Yep, look at me, I'm drawing. Right? Can you guys, you guys, did you see something? I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Okay, erased. The squiggler. So, the squiggler. That's my new nickname, I guess. So, yes, yeah, so um, there's this concept that when I teach this to attorneys, a lot of times I get people in the room, they're like, oh, I haven't heard that before. I know everybody, I know everyone, you guys have, I know all lawyers have heard of the concept of piercing the corporate veil. That's a concept that kind of gets some attention um, in most any kind of training, professional training that you go through. What it really means is this, we all need to know this concept of inside out and outside in, I'm doing it twice on purpose. We need to know this concept, okay? People put stuff in real, uh, put stuff in LLCs all the time, right? They jump online, open an LLC, and they do a quick claim. They jump online, create an LLC, and they give that to the title company. And fine, great, gets on the title, and they're like, yeah, nobody can sue me. Okay, here's how it really works. So we're gonna do a quick primer on asset protection. First rule of asset protection is nobody should ever, 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 ever think that whatever plan they put together, LLCs, trust, doesn't matter, they should never live under the delusion that it is what is going to protect them. Okay. And what I mean by that is if you, when you really dig in and start learning asset protection and how the lawsuits actually transpire, how they go up on appeals, how they get sent back down for a new trial, and then how it eventually gets resolved, you know, when the, the plaintiff wins or the defendant wins, who's actually writing the check, you understand that no asset protection plan is going to be the thing that actually protects you. Because the best asset protection plans never get tested. That's the best asset protection plan. It's the one that doesn't go all the way to trial and doesn't go up on appeal and doesn't get sent back down. The best asset protection plans act as a deterrent. That is the biggest and most fundamental misunderstanding of asset protection strategies is that, yep, I did this and now I'm foolproof. Nobody can come after me. It's just wrong. The, the, the main purpose of asset protection strategies is to create a deterrent from people coming after you, from some plaintiff's lawyer, from somebody thinking they've got a lawsuit. They find a lawyer and the lawyer's like, yeah, I can sue them. Your asset protection plan is to create a deterrent from that lawyer thinking they can get to the pocket 
the, 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 the pot of money. So inside out, this is the, the general concept that whatever is inside one legal entity, we want to stay in there. We don't want it getting out. We want it to stay inside its own bubble. So what are the things that exist inside a bubble? It could be money. It could be assets. It could be um, investments. It could be real estate. It could be a car. It could be whatever it is. Whatever's inside here, it could be worth some, some dollars. It also could be some debts, right? Could be credit cards, could be liabilities, could be personal loans, things like that. It could also be accidental stuff. Um, I don't know how to draw something that's an accident, so we'll just do an A. Actually, I know, we'll be really nifty here. Watch this, I'm gonna do an A in red. Um, and actually, we'll even trace that in red. So yes, the, there could be assets and liabilities inside this thing. You don't want either of those getting out. That's the concept of inside out, because if something gets out of here, whether it's the money or the debt, that means it's going after your other bubble of debts. Again, you don't want your money getting out because it may have to go satisfy other debts. And you don't necessarily want your liabilities getting out because then they're gonna come after your other assets, okay? So your bubbles, you want them to stay separate. That's why people create multiple LLCs for residential real estate or commercial real estate but each one separately in its own LLC. You must, 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 must operate that thing from year to year to year to year correctly. You must maintain the records. You must maintain its separate bank account. You must maintain all the formalities of a business. It can't just be, you get to mix it all up and shuffle the money around however you want. If there's a residential piece of real estate in one LLC, that entity needs to operate as a standalone entity, okay? If you have multiple residential real uh, pieces of real estate, each one is in its own LLC, what you might do is have each LLC own, or you know, different LLCs own the properties, and a new LLC act as the property management company for all of them. So all the rent goes here, and all the repairs are paid out of here, and the profits are paid from there to you, you can do that. But what you don't want to do is start mixing the money up and the money flow between the different entities. That's, that is the first place that a good lawyer is going to be able to show you messed up your entity structure, and they now should be able to get out of that one bubble. The reason you do multiples of these is because if somebody trips and falls, somebody slips out front, somebody gets hurt in any way whatsoever on one of your properties, it's only that property that can be held liable, okay? Um, um, there was something I was just thinking of that's escaping me. Oh, so, I mean, even more so if you have residential properties with pools on them. Uh, one of the very first cases that I worked on as a, as a law clerk, um, I was working with a lawyer. He was defending the apartment building that had a pool and they were being sued. So was everybody else, but they were one of the defendants being sued because a, a four, five, six year old girl drowned in the jacuzzi while somebody was having a party there and she died. And um, you know, the family obviously got picked up by a lawyer and they filed suit against everybody. Whoever owned that apartment building, I don't remember, I was a law clerk, it was years ago, but they better have owned that thing separately from everything else they owned. Because if it ended up finding some liability and they didn't have the insurance to pay the whole judgment, then they were gonna end up having to sell and um, give them the building basically. But as long as they own it separately and operated it and they can't pierce that corporate veil, then that's all. So even if they got a $10 million judgment, if all they could come up with in that entity was $3 million, 
and the $3 million goes to them and that entity files bankruptcy and that's the end of that liability. It doesn't get out to your other assets. That's the whole concept of inside out asset protection. The other, the third big concept of asset protection is layers. Um, like I said, it's supposed to be a deterrent. It is not supposed to be something that we think, oh yeah, I don't have to do anything about this now. I did all I need to do and I'm protected forevermore. Mm -mm. You create layers of asset protection. Now, the let me just get rid of all of this. The first layer, I, I don't like the first layer being an LLC. I think the first layer around your assets should be, and you should know, they should just be the, the certain things that our law says are exempt from creditors no matter what. The whole category of things. Um, homestead ex, uh, exemption, right? That has just been raised. That's exempt from creditors. Um, cash value of life insurance policy that have been around for more than two years, exempt from creditors. IRA balances up to a million dollars, exempt from creditors. And a whole bunch of other little things like that. Maybe not little, I mean, some, some important things. All of that, that's your first protection. You don't need anything. You don't have to do anything to get those protected. They can't get it from you. That's your first layer. Second layer is not an LLC. It's insurance. We all should have appropriate insurance, right? We've got car insurance. We've got health insurance. We've got life insurance. We've got everything kind of insurance. We all should have umbrella insurance. We all should have insurance for our professional licenses. That's the next thing. Somebody drops, drops a lawsuit into your lap, you want to be able to go, oh, uh, here, insurance company, defend me. That's what insurance does. Then they hire a lawyer, they spend the money, they defend you. Your responsibility is to come up with your deductible. Next layer, yes, that's where I'm talking about LLCs. And, and usually that first layer or that, that layer right there is just going to be a single LLC, not anything more complicated than that. Um, when you start adding multiple in, I consider that to be the fourth layer where you have multiple LLCs floating around out there. Some of them are parents, subsidiaries, some of them are sister entities, whatever, but that's where you get multiple entities and you're creating more and more layers. And then um, the next two are where we're looking at some asset protection trusts. And generally speaking, the the, this first one is a domestic asset protection trust. We might use Nevada, uh, South Dakota, Wyoming. Arizona has some really good laws for domestic asset protection trust, um, just depending on the situation. But then after that, we're looking at foreign asset protection trusts. I don't do foreign asset protection trusts. Um, we use a specialist attorney who does and when that's necessary. All these layers, again, not a foolproof absolute guarantee that you're gonna win the asset protection battle. You put these layers in place so that if somebody sues you or sues one of your entities or something, your lawyer can respond and say, here's all the reasons why we're not liable, number one. But then number two, hey, plaintiff's attorney, just guess what? If Even if you win, your, the, your pot of money is this big, it's teeny tiny. You've got the insurance policy that was here and the one house or whatever, like that's it. So good luck. And trust me, there are no plaintiff's lawyers out there who want to try to figure out a way to break through all these layers to get to the real pot of money. They don't. They have much easier fish to fry. They're going to go after the next thing. They see the barriers, they are deterred from taking action. So this is the primer on asset protection. Um, let me give you the next big thing, which is well, what happens to all of this stuff? And you know, we, we are dealing with a couple of these right now. What happens if, you, if the seller, if you're, if you're either representing the buyer or you're representing the seller, but the seller, is in capacity or has issues. Um, some of you have had this happen before. We deal with it a lot because we get called when the problem comes up. Um, comes up in two circumstances. Either you're listing a property and it becomes apparent or it is apparent at the outset that the, the seller has dementia, has Alzheimer's, um, is just aging, 
maybe there was a stroke, whatever. There's some kind of issue that's making their level of understanding diminished, right? And it's either already pretty obvious to everybody that they don't, they can't participate in signing a legal contract, um, or it starts to get suspicious. And uh, Arizona law puts all of us, all of us licensed professionals, we are all mandatory reporters if we think there is exploitation of one of these people. So we can't just turn a blind eye and say, nope, I don't see it. I don't see anything. Just sign right here, ma'am. Just sign right here. None of us are allowed to do that. And so we have to, if we start seeing something funny, we have to call it out. So if it gets identified, then the seller can't sign. They can't sign the closing documents. They really shouldn't have even signed the listing agreement. But if it's gotten to that point, um, then the title company is going to justifiably ask for a legal somebody who can sign on their behalf. And that's either going to be a valid power of attorney or if they don't have a valid power of attorney or they've got one that's so old or they got one that's a photocopy and it doesn't have all the right powers or whatever, it's just not good enough, then uh, the court can appoint a conservator. And that's the uh, other option. Um, I'll explain real quick what a conservator is um, versus a power of attorney. Power of attorney is something you guys all know what these are. You can sign them while you're well, while your brain is all here and designate somebody else to do all these legal matters for you. But you can only do that while you're well. If you haven't done it or it's too old, then the only thing left to do is to get that person who would have been the power of attorney to have the court give them that power. That's kind of what it is. So the incapacitated person can't give them the power but the court can under our laws. The way the court does that is through a probate process called conservatorship. It's a nightmare. It's a giant pain in the butt. It's super expensive. The court's going to appoint like two or three other attorneys to investigate. They're going to appoint an investigator. They're going to appoint, uh, they, the court um, has a bunch of employees in a department called probate accounting, where all these accountants are going to start doing forensic accounting on the person. It's a gigantic, expensive nightmare but sometimes it's necessary and there's no choice. We have to sell the house kind of a thing. So generally speaking, those cases um, to get somebody appointed, it's not, not a big surprise to me if the fees are $40,000 among all the lawyers and professionals that have to get involved. Can it happen quickly? Uh, yeah, if there's an emergency, it can. Um, the fact that there's a closing date on a real estate purchase contract may or may not be considered an emergency. It just depends on what else is in front of the court right now. If they have a whole bunch of people who are, you know, like Terry Schiavo, where they're going to uh, withdraw life support and those people are all lined up in front of the judge, the judge is not going to take this one in front of those. So it just depends if, if it can be heard as an emergency. We can usually get the judge to hear something in a week or two, um, but if not, it's you're looking at six to eight weeks before the judge can look at this. Um, and then if if you have to do conservatorship, you're looking at an annual process that's about ten thousand dollars a year to file all the court accounting uh, paperwork. It is a nightmare, and this has to go on year after year after year after year after year until the person passes away. Set up a power of attorney. Have your client set up power of attorneys. Have them redo it every couple of years. Uh, it's not fun, but holy cow, it is a lot more fun than a conservatorship. And it's way cheaper. So now that's one time you might run into a glitch at closing is if it's an incapacity issue. We unfortunately see um, a lot of times where somebody will actually end up um, representing the the family and the house is still in mom's name and mom has already passed away and then it's like titles like hey we need someone to sign this oh there's nobody alive great guys we need an executor we need letters of appointment and that is what probate is known for um that's what those things mean is letters of appointment and so in order to get somebody appointed the family has to hire a lawyer, has to go to court. It's not the whole $40,000 problem that we have with conservatorship, but it, it's still you know ten dollars to $20,000, just depending on what the situation is. If the real estate doesn't have a lot of equity and it's been more than six months since the person died, okay, 
two criteria under $100,000 of equity, more than six months since they died, then there's a, a shortcut process. Again, there's like five other things that also have to be true. No other probates uh, pending. Everybody's in agreement. A couple other things that I'm not remembering. Um, but if all the, if it fits within all that very strict criteria, then generally they can do it for like 3000 and get it done in a few weeks and you can still close. But um, usually, you know, the general probate process is going to be um, pretty expensive. They can get the authority to close in about um, uh, 30 days. So they, they should be able to close on the property if, if they've got it under contract. Uh, but then the, the funds have to sit in probate until probate is done, which can be nine months, 18 months, just depending on how much the family is cooperating or not. Um, okay, we're cruising along. Estate taxes. Who wants to talk taxes? I don't want to talk taxes. I want to talk tax saving. And this is my beautiful cursive on the keyboard. Oops. Um, so here's the thing right now. Um, estate taxes are only triggered at death. But we all need to know about them because the way to avoid it at our death is to do something about it now. And my, my wealthiest clients are either business owners or real estate investors. Those are the two. Um, the business owners, generally, they've got everything invested in one business, and they're just growing that thing like mad. Uh, a couple of them have diversified into a couple other businesses. Real estate investors, they usually have lots of pieces of real estate, you know, some commercial, some residential, whatever. Okay. Those clients who have businesses and real estate, those are the ones you need to be like they're, you know, like um, you're the x-ray machine. They throw out a little comment and you go, wait a minute, let me run that through. Oh, wait, this is a problem you should really know. So I'm going to give you those like tips and tools so you can kind of scan their situation. The first thing is that right now, yes, um, 2022, the estate tax exemption is 12.06 million. That is how much passes estate tax free. Okay. So no estate tax. Okay. The other number in 2022 is $16,000 per year is the um, annual gift tax uh, a exclusion, the exemption exclusion. This is how much you can give away every year and pay no gift tax. Why are we talking about both of these? The reason we're talking about both of these, estate tax exemption and gift tax, annual gift tax limit. The reason we're talking about both of these is because this here's how you can here's how we solve this for people. This is what I love. Um, annual gift tax. Okay. Here's how you solve these. The estate tax. If you're over that when you die, you pay like fifty percent of it to the government. Huge to the federal government, the IRS. Except for you have to die this year to get that $12 million for free. So who's gonna vote that we implement that strategy for anybody on this call? No, nobody, right? That's not the strategy. So how do you take advantage of that strategy? Because that's not the year I'm planning on passing away, nor are any of you. It's gonna be some year in the future. You need to watch out for what Congress does. This is the highest that that number has ever been. This is the highest it's ever been. Well, I strike that. There was one year where it was unlimited. Okay, there was one year, I forget what year it was. Uh, I've got my list over here. 2009, uh, 2010, 2010, I think it was 2010, it was unlimited. I forget who the billionaire was, but he passed away in 2010, zero estate tax. Um, Francisco, I think he's the one that owned the Yankees. Yeah, it was the it was the owner of the Yankees. Thanks, Ray. Yes, and and literally billionaire. He died the right year. It was everybody in the state planning world was like amazed. Um, but we know Congress can change this, right? It's been as low as a million dollars in recent years, and if it's a million dollars, 
it includes your term life insurance benefits. Who has term life insurance, right? Me, all of us. Your term life insurance is a million bucks. You're in the estate tax. You're paying estate tax. And if they if they reduce the number. So we got to watch for that change, right? That's what we watch for every year. The way to take advantage of this number, because this is massively high compared to what it has been historically, is you do something this year. Because if you do something this year, you're grandfathered in for life. And that's what clients are doing now, is they're saying, wait a minute, you mean if I do something about this now, I'm grandfathered for life, even if Congress reduces this down to a million? Yup. And here's how, it's because this number is also the number that's the lifetime e gift exemption. So they synchronize these two things up so that you can either give away $12 million during your life and then have zero left when you die, or you can do none while you're alive and when you die, there's 12 million. But you don't get both, you either can do it as a gift or at your death. Well, guess what? You can do gifts anytime. You can do them now. And so that's one of the big strategies for a lot of clients right now who've got 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, 6 million in total net worth. Because you know what? I'm kind of, we have a lot of clients in their 50s or in 60s who have 3, 4, 5 million. And if you're in your six, you know, you're 60 years old, you're planning to live at least another 20 years, right? I think we all are like 20 years far away, right? 20, 30 years, 40 years. Well, if you're moderately invested, you've got a generally diversified total net worth, some real estate, some investments, some other things. That whole net worth, it's going to double at least every 10 years, maybe sooner. And so, geez, if right now I'm at 3 million and I'm 50, it's going to be 6 million when I'm 60. It's going to be 12 million when I'm 70. It's going to be 24 million when I'm 80. Wait a minute. I'm going to have a massive estate tax problem if they don't keep increasing the number, which by all guesses, they can't. They're going to reduce this number because uh, taxing you at death is the least controversial way of raising tax revenue. The beneficiaries are kind of like, well, okay, whatever. You take 50%, I take 50%. We're all good. So that's the place where all of us expect they're going to raise taxes. But you can completely avoid that and lock in this year's $12 million by doing lifetime gifts. I don't recommend making gifts just, okay, here you go, kids, take it all. No, my recommendation is you gift these things into very special purpose trusts that you stay in control of that nobody can touch unless you say, and that actually there's back doors for you to be able to still access those funds. It is a certain type of irrevocable trust. It is not what you're pulling off the shelf, at, at, you know, a revocable living trust to avoid probate. Great tool, gotta use them. This is an irrevocable trust that cannot be undone except for some of the backdoor techniques, right? And with that, you stay trustee, your clients stay as trustee, whatever it is, but we've gotten it out of your estate. So like, let's say I had 5 million, among all my total net worth, pull off two, put it into this thing. So now I'm at three, this two, if it doubles, it's not doubling what's in my estate. I use two out of that 12 and that's it. I use two, right? Now we have some clients who have 30, 40, 50 million dollar estates, one client almost a hundred million. And they're using their, you know, married couple, they each have 12 million. They're using their full 12 million. They're gifting 24 million out of their estate right now, getting it into one of these trusts. They won't have any estate exemption left when they die, unless Congress raises that number beyond 12 million. They're like, that's fine because that. 24, it's going to keep growing. We know it is. And it's at least out of our estate. Can't be taxed at our death. What's really cool is the way you set these up. It can't be taxed at your children's death in their estates or their children or their children or their children. It's a pretty cool tool. So that's one thing with the estate tax exemption and how this is the year to lock in that massive number. Again, this 12 million is going to go down by all of our guesses and, and all the discussions about what Congress is set to do. With the annual gift amount, 
um, we generally don't hear a lot of people talking about how to use this strategy to also reduce the size of an estate. But the way to do that is to take your holdings, or if your clients have lots of real estate holdings in LLCs, what's neat about that is they don't actually individually own the real estate title anymore, right? The LLC does. So the individual, the human, owns the sort of ownership interest of the LLC. Aha, well, that's a very easy interest to break up into little pieces and give away, like giving away like one share of stock, right? So what you what you can do with that $16,000 per year, if you have two, um, you have a married couple, I just want to show you the math of what we did for this one client. Whoops. Um, and what, what they did, there was, uh, it was a married couple and they each uh, we're going to give 16K per year uh, to each of their family members. And, and so what does that mean? Well, they had, um, they had three children. They had um, three in-laws. All their kids were married and they were long-term marriages. They got along so wonderfully. They were like, there is no question. We are including them in our whole plan. And so fantastic. They're allowed to make that choice. And then they had something like 12 grandkids, most of them who were over 18. Some were minors. Um, they did have great grandkids, but they didn't want to um, go down to that generation. So they said, okay, here's who we have and here's everybody that we want to give to. So they got to, because it was a married couple, they got to do 16,000 each. So it was actually 32,000 per year from the married couple that they were going to give out. And what they had here was 12, we had 18 um, family members. So you do 32,000 times 18 family members. That's 50, I'm uh, sorry, it's $576,000 per year that they could gift out of their estate. Half a million dollars, right? It's not, I mean, this is not insignificant. The, um, I just totally chopped up my, my thing. What did I do? Do do do. I don't know. Three. Oh, I know what I did. Three children. So they had this really phenomenal um, strategy to get over half a million dollars out of their estate <clears throat> and use none of their lifetime gift exemption amount, that 12 million. They didn't have to use any of it because this is in addition to that. Okay. Um, they also combined it with another strategy. We'll go into this on another uh, talk sometime, but discounting, they took each of their shares of their LLCs to, to equate to, to that $32,000 gift. They valued all their entities and they said, okay, we're giving you 16,000, but in shares. But they also did some additional things to get a discount on the valuation. So in reality, when you use a discounting strategy, you can generally get a 30 to 40% discount. What the value of the underlying assets was, was about a million dollars per year that they were able to gift out of their estate. It was pretty phenomenal. So you do this for two, three, four, five, six, seven years, and all of a sudden you're, gift, you're getting out of your estate millions of dollars. And they were, again, giving it to the, kind, to the type of trust that they stayed in control over. None of their kids or in-laws or grandkids had control until they passed away. And then they designated one person to be in charge and these things stayed in a nice asset protected generation skipping um, uh, trust for their family for the multiple generations. And as those real estate entities were um, developing profit, each you know cash flow like profit, 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 they would distribute it into the trust, and the trustee can make discretionary distributions to all of the beneficiaries based on their percentages. And so everybody still could get like that nice dividend check every quarter or every month, whatever the process was for them. Okay, before I run out of time, Sarah, I want to make sure we do talk uh, a little bit about um, uh, inflation. So, <laughs> right, what? What do you mean inflation, Francisco? What's going on with inflation? Um, I don't think there's any question uh, that we're in an, we're we're squarely within an inflationary cycle, and um, you know interest rates boom overnight. Um, uh, cost of living has been just going through the roof. I was taking my son to school on one Friday. Gas was three ninety nine. I had 
you know, worked its way down to 399. I was like, oh, there's a three in front of it. That's pretty cool. The next day it was 419. It was 419 until Friday. Then it was 459 again. I'm just like, holy crap. Like we can't count on anything these days. Um, so yeah, we have this weird dynamic, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Highest inflation rate in the country with 13%. I mean, it just, ugh. So if you study economics a little bit, you understand that a recessionary cycle, um, like the things we should do as business owners in a recession, right? As, as, um, as the volume of business is going to start going down, actually differ from what the things that we should be doing during an inflationary cycle. Think about this. Um, you know, 13%, the worst in the country. Um, do you guys know what it was in Argentina in the last year? It's, I think, I think they're close to triple digit inflation. I know they're double digit, um, but I think they're close to triple digit. Places like um, Colombia, Venezuela, they're experiencing massive, massive devaluation of the currency that we just, we don't even know what it feels like. And and I've got friends from Argentina, from Colombia. Um, I don't have any from Venezuela, but the way they describe what their family does at the end of the workday when they get paid, because they get paid in local currency. It's like, okay, end of the workday, guys, here's your 10, here's your 20, here's your 50, whatever it is. They literally are sprinting to the grocery store because from the time it takes for them to get their money to the time they get to the grocery store, the cost of a loaf of bread, a bag of flour, whatever, has gone up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. Just in that time, they're sprinting to get rid of their dollar bills, their currency, and to turn it into something that's useful. In an inflationary cycle, Business owners should be acquiring the goods that we need. We should be prepaying the things that we need because costs are going to be more tomorrow than they are today for the exact same thing. But in a recessionary cycle, we should be hoarding our cash and stockpiling our cash because the recession means prices are going to be driven down because there's less of a demand on goods. And as we've seen with the housing market, it started to do the right? I mean, already seen my neighbor put her house up for sale. This was, um, what was it? I think it was right about 30 days ago. I mean, like just a few days before interest rates went up, she put it up like her real estate agent was like, we can totally list it like right here. Top of the market's going to be great. They actually got an offer like the, like two days later inspection period, interest rates went way up. They backed Whoop, they backed right out and now it's been sitting there and they're dropping the price. And you guys have all been having conversations about this. So there's this weird like tension between we're in a, both a recessionary cycle and an inflationary cycle. And so what should buyers, what should sellers do? They really shouldn't try to control their life on macroeconomic scales. They need to decide what they need to do for their life at the micro economy of their individual situation. That is how I talk to my clients and both our estate planning practice and our financial wealth management firm, because we have no control over the macro economy, zero, none whatsoever. We only have control over our micro economics. What, do, what does our individual family situation need? If we need to sell, we need to sell. That's just what it is. If we don't need to sell, great, put it up for rent. Let's rent it out for four years. Um, if we need to buy a house before prices can come down anymore, we need to buy a house, period. If we don't need to buy now, we can wait another six, nine, 10 months. Great, let's wait. And so that's, I make that distinction for my clients because a lot of people get just too confused in all of the media hype between, you know, the world is crashing and I, I shouldn't, I can't do anything because I don't know what the perfect answer is. And, and our job is to pull them out of that so they get clarity so they can make a decision. And so I distinguish it between the macroeconomic scale and the microeconomics. Um, so right now, from an estate planning perspective, because prices are starting to come down on both the stock market and the real estate, 
what we're doing with those is now that those values have come down is we're using that as an advantage to get more out of their estates than we ever could before. You know, a year ago, the real estate values were just, they were at the top of the market, at the top of what they had been. I mean, they just, we all know that. And if we would have gifted into these irrevocable trust at those rates, at those values, we'd be using up more of their lifetime gift amount or more of that annual gift exclusion. Now that prices have come down, we basically get to squeeze the same piece of property into the strategy at a lower value. So there's really good incentive right now to take advantage of what has happened with the markets. Um, the interest rate rise is also a kind of a weird, again, these are just like uh, macroeconomic discussions, but the interest rate rise actually also changes a couple of the um, other strategies that I don't use a ton, but charitable remainder trusts are really important if somebody has a massive capital gain and they need to, um, they need to avoid that capital gain. They can use a charitable remainder trust, sometimes a charitable lead trust, but those interest rates are going to affect how much of a deduction you get and how much the remainder interest is going to be. Um, and so the higher interest rates are definitely affecting that um, as, as we consider all of that. Whew. Okay, I didn't take a breath to stop for questions, but we can do that now. Any of these topics, happy to take questions on. You guys can just unmute yourself I have uh, a or drop something in the chat. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Um, so I have some properties, each in an individual LLC. Um, and I just, as you were talking, I got to thinking, I'm pretty sure that they're all um, named under a personal umbrella policy. Um, but at the time that I added it to my personal umbrella, I don't think I had transferred them into an LLC. And it, so it just dawned on me. Um, I, I guess my question is this, is once you have, let's say, multiple properties in an LLC, do you know what is the proper umbrella policy uh, if yeah. it's no longer in your individual name? Yeah, you'll keep one in your individual name for your individual purposes, but you'll add another one for the entities itself. And so the same agent may be able to do a commercial uh, liability yeah. policy on those LLCs. And that's really what you'd be looking for. Okay. And then one other question, um, flipping through reels on Facebook or something, and I, I, I'm pretty sure the terminology the guy used is... He was talking about having, I think he referred to it as a holding company that held all of his LLCs. And I was wondering yep. what you could say about that. Yeah, so kind of, I'll give you guys a quick structure. Um, so the real typical kind of thing is that you've got, is there a way to duplicate? Yeah, look at that. You've got these, all these LLCs um, holding your various pieces of property down below. You need two, um, there's two, there's two parties really to one LLC. It's the member and the manager. The member is the owner and you can make the owner another LLC. And that's kind of what a lot of people refer to as a holding company. Um, because then you up here, whoops, you, oh, that's not the right thing. You up on the top are the only owner of this one LLC and it owns all the other ones. Are you drawing a, something right now? Yeah. Is it not showing? I, I'm not seeing it. Or is anyone else? So I see. What, you, what you can do on the left, there should be um, like um, on the whiteboard, there's an options on the bottom. There's like a thing. It says four. Yeah. If you click on those, it'll show you the different pages that are open. Yeah. and click on four. Okay, thank you. Okay, my bad guys. Thanks for saying something. I got it, Jim. I got it. Thanks for saying something. Um, so it would be the member of those entities. And that's what a lot of people will call a holding company, this top one. Sometimes we'll, we'll set up another LLC actually over here, like I was saying, and it sort of has this dotted line to all these entities because it's, it doesn't own the entities, this other company acts as the manager of those entities. 
Okay. And so this makes a lot of sense for real estate investors because it, just like you would hire a third party property management company to collect all the rents, set up all the tenants and blah, 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 blah. That's essentially what you're doing here. You just have enough of your own entities to justify having your own management entity. And then this entity collects the rent checks. It sends out the handyman, it vets the tenants. And then this one actually, uh, the management entity is where the money actually flows in and out on a on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis. And then it is also owned by that holding company, that master entity um, as a member uh, I can't. I can't write with this thing as a member of the um, of this management entity. That way, if it has any profits, it pays them out to the big entity up top. The only thing down here in these little ones is just it owns the title to the property. So that's a pretty common structure we we use a lot. And then by having all the money flowing through the managed, the managing LLC, but that's not owning it, that's not leaving the paper trail to connect the different LLCs? No, it's not creating any issue with regards to piercing a corporate veil because you're essentially each one of your LLCs is signing a, cert, a contract that says, hey, you, you're allowed to manage this property. Please manage it, collect my rents. And so it does. And then it does what all property management companies do. It maintains the escrow account. It, it accounts for all the transactions and then blah, 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 blah. And so it's just acting as a business. It, what's nice about that is it keeps those cash flows out of the master entity over here because the master entity over here is the one that's really building up the wealth. You know, I mean, that that owns the assets under underlying assets. It's going to get all this cash flow. That entity, you don't want it operating. You don't want it driving around on the streets. You don't want it. You want it to be as liability free as possible, as risk free as possible. You want it to be a really boring. It has no operations. It has no employees. It's really a holding company. And that's it. You know, the management company might be out there driving around in the car on the street. And if it gets in a car accident, it was the management entity, um, et cetera. And, and generally speaking, these property management companies, are, uh, our uh, accounting setup has them remove almost all of their cash as soon as possible. You know, I mean, they, they maintain very little as, as far as assets. A little bit of cash in the bank to just keep operations going, um, but no real building up of assets. It doesn't own an office building. It doesn't own anything of value. It just is. It's a pipeline. It money comes in, money goes out. It either goes out to the to the to the big entity up top, or it goes out to vendors and subcontractors and employees. Got time for another question, anybody? Hey, this is Jonas. I have a question. Um, so when properties are purchased under personal names initially, and then you're looking to set up either a trust or an LLC, is there pushback from the lenders move, moving that over into those you entities? Know, some yes, some no. Um, generally, what we'll do, if it's not a lender that you've done this with a lot and you're just going to close, close. Um, and everyone who's a lender, close your ears for a second. Um, <laughs> but we generally, after the close, will you know evaluate what the risk is with the with you know the client to be like, okay, what are the risks if we want to transfer this into the LLC at this point? And evaluate that risk, and if Ashley the risk is McCaffrey acceptable, Epic Phoenix Real Estate Group. How are you? That makes sense. We're hearing, we're hearing somebody's somebody's on the phone. To, um, I just wanted to touch base with you. It looks like somebody's on the phone. We're hearing their whole conversation. Just FYI. you just stepped out. Sorry. No problem. I just didn't want that to be here on the recording. Um, <laughs> yeah. So generally, we'll evaluate that risk. If the risk is acceptable, transfer it into the LLC. Um, and even sometimes just depending on, on the lender, we'll send written notice. And so far with that approach, over 
15 years and um, thousands and thousands of LLCs, I have not had any problem with lenders uh, when you do that. And if there is so a the risk being the like due on sale clause, correct? The, the risk yeah. being the mortgage, the mortgage you trigger and the due on sale clause, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Cool. You got and it. What we're seeing in title is a lot more lenders are willing to accept the vesting to be in a trust or an LLC. We're hearing more and more about, you know, consumers saying, hey, I'm refinancing or purchasing and I want to buy it and keep it in my entity. More and more are saying yes than ever before. Cool. cool. Well, maybe this is in my brain, but to me, it makes sense because obviously as the borrower, it seems like the lender, I understand it makes it complicated if they, from a foreclosure standpoint, but from a liability standpoint, it seems like they'd want the borrower protected. You know, <laughs> That's you know a good I mean? point, like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, great. You mean you're going to do something on some right. other property, get sued, and we're going to lose this one too? No. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Good point. I think that is uh, all the time we had. Um, I don't know how to clean up. Oh, there, there's a delete button. Look at that. I don't think I can delete those. So I'll leave you the whiteboard, Sarah. And um, if anybody does have questions after this, um, feel free to reach out to Ray. He'll drop his info there in the chat, if you would, Ray. Um, he's our community liaison. He, he's got access to all of our resources and things. Um, Sarah, we only have title, real estate, professionals, no clients on this, right? I, I believe so. I is in here. You can always send him to our website, keystonelawfirm.com. And we'll make sure that everybody gets your info and that officials, yeah, we'll send that yeah. all out. So everybody's cool. going to have access for sure Sounds to refer good. clients, of course. And Sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Francisco. We really appreciate it. Thank you know, you. we appreciate you guys Absolutely. coming on here uh, with us. Of course, I've got to, you know, give the clear title a plug too. If you're yeah. thinking about, you know, any real estate transactions and you need a great title company, we would love to assist you on any of the, you know, any future business. And especially we recognize that it's, it's a slog out there right now. There's a lot of confusing moving parts and, you know, just even what you said with like, Hey, an inflationary market, in a recessionary market wait it's the same you know, know. <laughs> it's, if there's things questions coming up let us know we'd love to talk with you more about you know working with clear title and of course francisco has been great i've referred him you know agents as yeah. well as con consumers and i just get great feedback so thank you francisco for everything absolutely you guys are great sarah and if you guys don't use sarah as a resource use sarah as a resource she's like our go-to title person so. love it Thank yeah, you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Sarah. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I wasn't.